Hi, I'm Stuart Spinks and welcome to episode 46 of my podcast, Beekeeping Short and Sweet. It's almost Christmas, so here's a brief review of 2018. Beekeeping Short and Sweet, a beekeeping podcast for the inquisitive beekeeper with a short attention span. A beekeeper, in fact, just like me. Hi everybody and welcome back to the podcast. Before we get stuck into the podcast today, I wanted just to mention that I'll be taking a couple of weeks off over the Christmas and New Year period just to recharge my batteries. So look out for the next podcast sometime around the first week of the new year. So this week I wanted to talk about what's happened over the past year. It's been a fairly busy season and I just wanted to cover off some of the highs and lows and share with you my beekeeping experience for this season. It seems a very long time ago that uh, spring arrived and we jumped at the chance of an early start to the season only for cold winds from the east to Batteris here in Norfolk in the UK. That particular storm earned the name The Beast from the East and I think I've mentioned it before in some of my podcasts. If I'm honest, I think that really caught me out at certainly one of my apiaries. That apiary was all national hives, and they were all on single brood boxes as well, which I don't tend to do. Uh, Normally, I would have them on at least a brood and a half, which is a brood box and a super. But I had added food to all of them in the form of some fondant, but it just wasn't enough for some of them, and I lost several colonies. Uh, There were smaller colonies in the same apiary uh, that had sufficient food but they just weren't able to withstand the severe cold and they also perished. It's why if you're a beginner beekeeper that you'll hear more experienced beekeepers telling you that the most important time of the year is late summer and early autumn. It gives you a chance to harvest some honey but also to treat your bees, get all the colonies ready build them up nice and strong so that they're large enough entities to survive the cold winter months. Anyway, once the cold weather gradually moved away, I was able to get a closer look at some of my colonies. In fact, we ended up going through all of them in just one day. And those that survived fell into three distinctive brackets. And it's no surprise, really. There were some very strong colonies, and these were colonies that seemed to be almost enjoying the extended cold period and they were actually bursting out of their hives. They had so many bees in them, I don't know where they were putting them all. There were also average colonies, and these were neither strong or weak. They were just, well, average. And as you expect, they made up the bulk of the colonies that had survived the winter. And finally, there were the weak ones. And we had several colonies that looked as if they should never have survived the winter, but somehow did. Bees covering maybe one or two frames, barely able to cover the small patch of eggs that the queen had laid and just looked in a fairly poor state. Those colonies, for the most part, survived into the summer but didn't really produce anything at all throughout the year. They just kind of sat there, gradually building up until almost the end of the season when they were actually strong enough to do something in terms of foraging but of course most of the forage was over by that time. Going back to the beginning of the season we were very excited to have a season-long sponsor in Paul Beardmore from Happy Valley Honey. Paul had sent over some of his honey poor Polly Langstroth hives for us to try out and we started off by carrying out a few shook swarms and those worked out perfectly as it happens. The colonies grew very rapidly on lovely new comb and pulled 10 frames of foundation in super quick time. They were really, really on the foundation very quickly. We obviously fed them throughout the duration of that period, but they were very, very quick to draw out that comb. We now have an apiary with 10 of the Happy Valley Honey Pour polystyrene Langstroth hives in, overwintering safely at the moment, and it'll be interesting to see how they perform coming through the winter and into the spring. Most of the times that we've had poly hives and compared them to the more traditional wooden hives, I would say there's not really been a great deal of difference between them. Some have performed well, some have performed poorly, and I think it's just a case of it's another material that you can choose to use for producing your beehives from. 
Each year I raise a few of my own queens from our limited stocks of colonies and with small numbers of colonies to select from it's always a bit hit and miss as to what you're going to end up with in terms of the traits of the new queens. We have open mating throughout all of our apiaries which means we don't have any instrumental insemination so the virgin queens go off and mate with whatever drones are available to them. We do try to set the colonies up so that we've got some extra drones from colonies that we want or hope that the virgin queens will mate with but generally allow them to go out and get on with it themselves and then we see what we end up with. But we did produce, for the most part, some very nice queens and they are now heading up colonies that will turn into production colonies for next year. And raising queens is a a very simple process that I think all beekeepers can have a go at. So if you're thinking about it, if you're a new beekeeper and you'd like to give queen rearing a go, then check out some of my videos and uh, just give it a try. It's uh, a lot of trial and error for the most part, and you'll soon learn what works best for you, and then you're on your way. Of course, the constant need to replace and renew queens means that queen rearing needs to be a focus for me every season, and next year I'm going to focus predominantly on just using the Nico system for my queen rearing. It's similar to the Genta system. There are some videos again on my YouTube channel showing the Nico system and it's an easy piece of kit to use and the results are consistent and I think that's the important thing. One thing I did notice this year is the high number of failed queen cells in several grafting attempts. These started with uh, a queen rearing two-day course that I hosted and although we managed to get a full 10 queen cells in one particular frame grafted and they all took eventually we ended up with just two viable queens two mated queens from that grafting so it shows you it's it's not always that easy to get the mated queens into colonies and heading them up successfully and that's why you should probably look to raise more queens than you think you're actually going to need because there's always going to be some failure factored in there the easiest method with the highest success rate for me was when I split colonies using the two nukes from one parent colony method. Swarm cells are by far the biggest and best queen cells that I seem to always get, and for small production numbers, that system works really well. So if you only want to produce maybe one or two queens, then producing two nukes from one parent colony is a really good way to do it. Honey production for the year was slightly up. Early season oilseed rape was terrible if I'm honest it was really poor and it almost seemed like the local farmers are planting varieties that flower earlier and earlier and at a time when our colonies really haven't built up strong enough to take advantage of any nectar flow. I did get all of the average colonies back up to strength probably by the end of the oilseed rape flow But it wasn't really until that very last flowering of the oilseed rape that we managed to get any crop at all. One surprising crop that we did get a decent amount of honey from was Phacelia. Surprising in that I hadn't seen any of it around any of my apiaries, but checking the pollen under a microscope confirmed that it was indeed Phacelia. And that's an excellent example of why you should get into microscopy for beekeepers in the new year. Being able to pop a sample under a microscope and identify the pollen types that are in your honey is really exciting actually and uh, well worth the effort that's required. As usual we lost a number of swarms despite my best efforts and these seem to be later than usual and that may be an impact of the beast from the east colder weather that we had but as I was splitting colonies for increases the swarm cells were welcome and we managed to fill quite a number of nuke boxes with splits and plump queen cells. Again, a mixed success rate with those queens. Some mated successfully, but we had to combine several of those nucleus colonies as queens had failed. I definitely think that if you're looking to grow a small beekeeping hobby into a business, taking it gradually and learning the ropes over a few years certainly helps prevent some of the major catastrophes that can lay in wait for you down the road. The summer was hot and dry for us here in Norfolk and although the bees were out foraging 
there seemed little surplus honey being stored away until very late in the season. I removed my crop of honey at the end of July and was pleasantly surprised actually at how much we managed to remove. All of the early season colonies had produced at least one super each, so if you're thinking of splitting colonies and want a summer crop, do it early enough for them to grow and then they can uh, build up in time for a, a summer hit. Later in the season, I had a visit from the National Bee Unit Bee Inspectors. Keith Morgan, our regional bee inspector, along with Dave Bonner, who's a very experienced seasonal bee inspector. We spent a very pleasant day visiting all of my colonies, and I'm glad to say that, kind of as I already knew, my bees were in perfect health. Well, I say perfect health. Almost all of them were in perfect health. I had one particular colony that was very sickly with chronic bee paralysis virus, and We've been trying to help them throughout this season and into the winter, and I've produced a number of videos showing the disease and the steps we've taken to eradicate it. Currently, the colony has been reduced into a nuke box and sits in a five-frame commercial nuke. All we can do now is watch and wait and see what they're like in the spring. Hopefully they'll make it through, but as I said at the time, with so many colonies and just this one infected colony, it may have been better to destroy them to avoid spreading the virus to other colonies. We've also spent a lot of time trying to help them out, so fingers crossed that they'll survive through to the spring and have shaken off the problem. I don't have any migratory crops to take to the heather, so for me, once I'm into August, it's treatment time and feeding for the winter through September. This year we treated with Apistan and that went really well. Although it's a six-week treatment, the bees coped very well with it and I think we went into the autumn with colonies having very low varroa counts. I know it's possible to get bees onto the heather and treat them once they get back and add extra feed if necessary, but I've never had that challenge so the process is pretty laid back for me in terms of timing through the autumn and into the winter. I like to think it gives the bees a late flush of summer nectar and allows them to set the brood for winter bee production prior to the ivy coming into flower. Also, with fewer varroa in the colony to cause any issues, I think my bees are stronger for it. I've been feeding my bees with a new sugar syrup this year, sent to me by Paul at Happy Valley Honey. It's called Happy Mix, and the bees really took to it. I'm also using the same product in fondant form this winter, and I'll report back in the spring as to how the colonies have got on with it. So here we are approaching the winter solstice feeling fairly happy with the season. There were no major issues and now with an eye on the new season which will be upon us very quickly. I'm now planning my mid-winter oxalic acid treatments which will happen over the next couple of weeks and I'll report back on how that went. My thanks particularly to Paul at Happy Valley Honey for his support of my various projects and also to everyone who supported me via my Patreon page. I really am very grateful for your support. Don't forget that you can get the very latest podcast and extra video content by signing up to my Patreon page, patreon.com forward slash Norfolk Honey. And I'll leave links in the show notes as usual. Well, that's it for this week. As I mentioned, I'll be taking a couple of weeks off over the Christmas and New Year period to recharge my batteries. I'd like to take this opportunity to wish you all a very happy Christmas, and we'll catch up soon. But until then, I'm Stuart Spinks, and that was beekeeping, short and sweet. 